Mr. Chancellor, as public orator, may I present Nazir Afsal as a candidate for an honorary degree. Nazir Afsal was born in Birmingham to parents who had recently emigrated from Pakistan. He was one of seven children. That was an era when racial abuse was largely, went largely unreported. He was bullied and racially abused on a daily basis in Marlborough Junior School in Small Heath. <clears throat> he preferred to keep this from his parents. Nevertheless, the experience left its mark on Nazir. He passed the 11 plus and went to Waverley Grammar School, where he was a very bright pupil, eventually taking six A-levels. Despite encouragement from his parents to become a doctor, his first choice was to study law at Birmingham University. Nazir became vice president of the Guild of Students and he took part in several student demonstrations against the policies of the government of the day. One involved him being carried in an open coffin through the campus. On graduation, as he moved to Guildford Law School for his Law Society finals. Nazir, Nazir returned to Glaziers in Birmingham for articles and he worked as a solicitor from 1988 to 1991. He decided that probate and company law was not what he wanted to do for the rest of his life, preferring to try his hand at criminal law and casework. Nazir moved to London to become a Crown, a Crown Prosecutor at Bow Street Magistrate Court, where he was much happier with the human interest of criminal prosecution work. He was promoted to Assistant Chief Crown Prosecutor in 2001. During this time, several of his cases reached the attention of the national media. One case involved the stalking of Lady Diana, and another, the death of a man who was committing aggravated burglary. Nazir decided that the householder acted in reasonable self-defense. In 2004, Nazir was approached by a group of women who presented compelling evidence of forced marriage and honor crimes in the UK. He organized a conference to bring these subjects into the open, and he set up a natural, national database to catalog dozens of instances of potential crimes. In 2005, Samira Nazir was murdered in an honor killing. Nazir was responsible for the prosecution of her relatives and described the beliefs that had led to her murder as tragic and outdated. By 2008, Nazir was the CPS lead in honor-based violence. At first, he thought these traditional attitudes would die out with the older, older immigrant generation. However, he soon realized that many young men still had strong controlling beliefs in honor and purity, and that changing this would need education starting at the primary school level. In his own words, I have talked to many Muslim women and I can tell you that their greatest fear is not Islamophobia or being attacked by racists or being arrested on suspicion of terrorism. It is from their own family. In the 1990s, evidence came to light that organized self, uh, sexual abuse of vulnerable underage girls was taking place in Rochdale. The crisis intervention team coordinator for the NHS, Sarah Robotham, collected evidence of widespread abuse. However, when it was presented to the police and to higher authorities, no action was taken, as it was decided that the evidence of the girls would not be believed. Several cases collapsed due to violent witness intimidation. It was clear that the victims of abuse and their families did not receive adequate police protection. In 2011, Nazir Afsal was appointed Chief Prosecutor for the North West of England. Nazir re reviewed the earlier decision not to prosecute in the Rochdale case. It was clear to him that the case laid bare dangerous attitudes to race, class and gender, which had allowed extensive organized criminal activity to go unchallenged. Nazir decided that the evidence of the vulnerable working class girls should be believed, and this resulted in a successful prosecution of the perpetrators. The trial attracted worldwide attention, 
and Nazia had to run the gauntlet of English Defence League demonstrators to get into the court, which reminded him of the abuse he experienced as a child. They shouted at him, go back to where you come from. But this time, he gave as good as he got and replied, I come from Birmingham. The story of the Rochdale case was the subject of a BAFTA award-winning three-part dramatization on BBC TV called The Three Girls, featuring the actor Ace Barty as Nazir. The Rochdale case is a landmark as it defined the limit of the culture of political correctness, which had prevented prosecution and several related cases followed. Since leaving the CPS in 2015, Nazir has spoken wild, uh, widely about, the vi about violence against women. He is clear that unhealthy attitudes to women occur in all sections of society. In his own words again, I've prosecuted perpetrators from more than 60 countries and dealt with victims from 50 countries. I know that there isn't a community where women and girls are not vulnerable to sexual attack. It is a power thing that infects every society. Therefore, our responsibility has to begin with listening to the victims and survivors. More recently, Nazir has held positions as a police and crime commissioner on the Independent Press Standards Organization and for the Welsh Government. From his family's origins in a conservative tribal area in Pakistan, where men often hold outdated views on male super superiority. Nazir becoming a feminist may have seemed unlikely. However, he believes that this background enables his message for a fundamental change in attitudes to women to be heard. Nazir has made over 500 me media appearances in the past five years, as well as countless speaking presentations, which has made him one of the best known lawyers in the country. Nazir Afsal received the OBE in 2005. He has received many awards from the legal profession, including the 2013 Services to Law Award at the British Muslim Awards, and in the same year, Legal Personality of the Year of, the Asia, of Asian Lawyers. Mr. Chancellor, on the recommendation of the Senate and Council, I present Nazir Afsal that you may confer upon him the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws. Chancellor, uh, Chancellor, Vice-Chancellor, distinguished guests, fellow graduates, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, parents. Let me say something to parents first. Uh, like you, I have in my wallet pictures of my children where my money used to be. <laughs> I have sacrificed, as you have, everything so that your children can have a better life than you, and I pay tribute to you for all that you've done and all that you continue to do. <laughs> As the orator quite rightly pointed out, this is a journey. I came from the traditional tribalistic parts of Pakistan to the traditional tribalistic parts of Birmingham, where I was born. I suffered abuse on a daily, if not weekly basis, uh, attacked as regularly as you can imagine. I remember saying to my attackers, sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words will not hurt me. And it worked, because after that, it was only ever sticks and stones. When I qualified as a lawyer and when I became a prosecutor, I thought suddenly they're going to let me go, but no. I was attacked by a group of men who used my head as a football. Thankfully, they were rubbish at football, which is why I live to tell the tale. When I organized a conference on sports crime and talked about how the behavior of players on the pitch impacts on spectators, impacts on the wider society, I got so much hate mail. One in particular, dear Mr. Rafsal, we English invented football. Please go back to Wogland. I looked at a globe and I couldn't find Wogland anywhere, but I found his name and address in a letter. If you don't act, if you don't respond, they act with impunity. They feel they can do what you like or what they like. 
And from my perspective, my journey is the journey of every victim and every survivor. I am privileged that over the generation, it's 30 odd years of being a lawyer, thousands of victims and survivors have shared their stories with me. When, it, when I learned about extremism and, and honor-based violence, I, according to the US State Department, have prosecuted more honor killings than anybody in the world. And yet, I feel a failure, because 100 women have had to die for each one of those prosecutions to succeed. The US State Department used to regularly call me up to ask me my views on how they should deal with forced marriage and honor-based violence, suddenly stopping in November of 2016. I have no idea what happened in November 2016. Um, <clears throat> when, I, um, when I dealt with um, the Danish cartoon protesters, some of you are familiar with, on the streets of London, and charged them with soliciting murder, uh, I ended up with a visit from Special Branch, who came to my home and said, Nazir, we're here to tell you you're on an Al-Qaeda death list. Uh, and I said, well, okay, what now? And they said, no, we're just here to tell you you're on an Al-Qaeda death list. When uh, the orator mentioned the Rostow grooming gang, some of you will have seen it undoubtedly. The actor who played me was much more handsome than I am. Uh, my wife's got a picture of him on the wall, which tells you everything. Um, but my memoirs come out next year, and it's going to be dramatized, and I've asked for Denzel Washington this time. So, um, but when I prosecuted that case, the far right came for me, not just during the case, but after the case. They uh, literally had fake news saying that I was the one that didn't prosecute these guys. And they ended up demonstrating outside of my home. They ended up in a situation where my children could only go to school by taxi, where I had a police officer stationed outside of my door for two weeks. I had done everything right in that case, yet I got 17,000 emails and letters calling for me to be sacked and sent home. Birmingham. <laughs> Who wants to go there? <laughs> my point is, that is as alive then as it is alive now. We know now what we're dealing with in terms of people who do not accept us if we're from a minority or we're diverse backgrounds or we have different differences. We are facing, ladies and gentlemen, a, an attack on equalities that we thought we'd taken for granted. If you are accused, if you're suffering racism, they call you a snowflake. If you are disabled, they say, prove it. If you are a woman who c claims that she's been sexually abused, they say, we don't believe you. If you are suff and suffering anti-Semitism or Islamophobia, they say it's in the mind. And if there are schools up and down the country who are being told right now, do not teach your children that gay people exist. That is the battle that we fight now. It's alive now as it ever has been. And it requires you all to take action. Twelve, sometimes people seem to think it's all about justice and all about criminal justice and all about outcomes. When I prosecuted the BBC presenter Stuart Hall, he was convicted of the abuse of 11 women and found not guilty of one. And I went to the one that he was found not guilty of and I said to her, I'm really sorry that I couldn't give you closure. She said, you gave me closure at the moment that you believed me. Sometimes it's not a judicial outcome. It's the fact that somebody in authority takes their side. Somebody listens to them. And that's what we've failed to do for generations. We have told children, be seen and not be heard. Why are we now surprised that they're telling us what's been happening to them over years, if not decades? My journey started 20 odd years ago when I, I noticed a woman in an event and she came up to me. I noticed that she had her wedding ring, not on her wedding finger, but on the opposite finger of her hand. And I said to her, why do you wear your wedding ring on the wrong finger? And she said, it was they beat me and forced me to marry the wrong man. And I looked at this woman who now suffers daily rape, who has a life of hopelessness and despair, and whose only ability to protest is by wearing that ring on this hand, because she didn't have a voice. I made it my responsibility, ladies and gentlemen, as it is your responsibility to be the victim's voice. Thank you very much indeed.